to start the next session, which is Barry O'Neill from Story uh, sorry, Story Toys, who's the uh, CEO, and he's going to be talking about kids apps, the monetization minefield. So I know you guys are all going to want to be listening for this. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, so um, I'm the CEO of Story Toys, and um, Story Toys is operates in the uh, well, maybe you can guess by the name, operates in the books category, uh, but the book apps category. However, um, I've been talking a lot about uh, monetizing kids' content and talking a lot about COPPA um, over the last uh, few months. So I thought um, that I would uh, run a, a session that uh, talks about the minefield that is kids' monetization, both you know, in general terms and also since the changes to, to COPPA. Um, a minefield is a sub... A situation presenting um, unseen hazards and um, something that uh, that there are a lot of in the uh, in the mobile in, in the kids app business so I'm going to talk about COPPA I'm going to talk a little bit about what's happening around the world and then I'm going to talk about best practice in monetization which uh, unfortunately might actually seem like worst practice in some cases um, a COPPA 101 and um, everybody probably knows that COPPA has nothing to do with monetization uh, which is interesting considering that the Majority of parents are really concerned uh, around uh, aggressive monetization tactics in mobile apps at the moment. Um, I was getting calls from people right up to the 30th of, uh, of June um, asking me, are Apple going to pull my apps because I've got monetization um, in application purchases? Does COPPA deal with this? And it doesn't. COPPA is really about having a clear privacy policy about uh, how you deal with children's um, information um, online. It's been around since 2000. Um, the changes in July 1st, provided clarifications specifically in the, in the app space and also how you use that data. And um, so I'm of, often asked what it's about. And um, it's really about having a, a, a privacy policy and a statement and just treating personally identifiable information with great care. Uh, and that personally identifiable, identifiable information uh, really concerns children under 13. So um, and I guess one of the key things that you need to understand about COPPA is that uh, you, know, you are liable for third-party services, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And also that there's a 16, 000, up to a $16,000 fine for bre per breach of COPPA, um, which is pretty steep considering that a lot of apps could have multiple breaches. So personally identifiable information, well, you know, it's name, address, email address, but it's also things like screen name, image, video, audio likenesses, geolocation data, which is used, and persistent identifiers, which is very, very common to find these used in, uh, in, in, in any applications, particularly when it comes to things like managing cross-promotion and uh, determining, you know, how effective your, your monetization strategy is. Um, and as I said, it covers also third-party use and collection of, um, of, you know, of data. So, and it's important to understand this because third parties, obligations under COPPA apply to you. This is actually from, um, from an FTC bulletin. The obligations apply to you when third parties like ad networks or plugins collect personal information through your app. Very, very important to know. So this is a screenshot from a, a very popular kids app, which, um, which I pulled yesterday. And... Um, you know, this, is, this has been updated since, um, since the COPPA regulations came in. And if you look down the bottom here, it says, um, it says yeah, about third parties, um, that their privacy policy, not ours, will apply to any of those interactions. This is absolutely untrue. And the suggestion that what you might do is that parents need to review of these lists of third party services um, and privacy policies before using the apps is just ridiculous. So this is clearly not a COPPA compliant privacy policy. So one of the things that you hear about with COPPA, and sorry, I'm trying to set the background. I'm really going to rush through these COPPA pieces because I really want to get onto um, what's happening around the world. But one of the things about COPPA is um, the, the idea that if you are collecting this data and you, you want to use it in an online, in an online capacity, um, you need to collect verifiable parental consent. Now, these slides, I think, will be up on the, uh, on the Casual Connect slide, as, as, as site later. But, you know, verifiable parental consent is actually quite ridiculous, um, i.e. providing a consent form to be sent, to be returned by a U.S. mail. I mean, that's not practical in an app. Requiring that the parent um, provides credit card details, well, Apple won't let you do that. Um, having the parent call a toll-free telephone number, verifying a parent's identity by checking a form of government-issued identification, and uh, then promptly deleting that, uh, that, um, that information afterwards. These are not practical things to do. Um, so it's very difficult for app developers to avoid COPPA or to try to collect this parental consent. And then I'm not going to spend any time on this slide, but who must abide by it? I guess the key thing here is 
anyone who operates an online service or commercial website. Now, an online service applies to apps as well that is attractive to children below the age of 13. Doesn't mean that it has to be targeted at, but is attractive. What's attractive to a child under 13? Well, you know, a game about candy is attractive to a child under 13. So you need to be very careful about when you're making your apps that if it is in any way attractive, you need to address COPPA through your privacy policy. So what is allowable under COPPA? This comes up a lot as well. Um, I think most people would understand if you're in the kids space, uh, there was an issue um, with Flurry just before the new COPPA regulations came in. Flurry determined that the current system was not COPPA compliant. Um, so metrics are allowable to support internal operations. And again, there's a lot of information on the website about what internal operations are. Internal operations you know, can be analytics. Internal operations can be to provide contextual advertising. Um, internal operations can be to provide personalization services. So these things are allowable without verifiable parental consent. So conversion rate analysis, for example, falls under that, depending on how you do it, though. If you're using a third-party tool that's using geolocation and then selling that data um, onto others, that is not COPA-compliant conversion rate analysis. And then advertising. Contextual advertising is OK. Uh, behavioral advertising, where you're tracking a user across multiple apps, third-party apps, and targeting advertising on that basis, which is a lot of ad trackers do, is not OK. I guess this kind of brings me on to the next piece of the, um, of the presentation. What about $99 IAPs? Absolutely no problem. And this is an issue, because in many ways, COPA does not address what is the biggest concern for parents, which is kid-targeted apps pushing high-priced consumable IAPs. And um, brings me to the key points of this, uh, of this talk, which is the monetization minefield. But, but firstly, um, I want to give a quick history lesson. How many people have been in the mobile industry for the last 10 years? Anybody in here? OK, great. You poor people. Um, I'm, I'm with you on that. So let's have a quick history lesson. Um, remember this? This will not leave your head for the day. Who remembers Crazy Frog? Great. Bet you thought you'd forgotten about him. In 2005, um, you might remember that, uh, particularly in the UK, right across Europe, there were issues around Crazy Frog. There was a premium rate services regulator that determined that um, the selling practices on Crazy Frog needed to be investigated. The selling practices for things like Crazy Frog included uh, television advertising, advertising free content. You texted, again, this is pre-smartphones, you texted, you know, 5-8 uh, five eight and 5-8s, uh, five and, uh, you know, you got signed up for some free content, and that free content was generally not free. If you have a look here, uh, it was actually six pounds per fortnight, which is about $16 per month, which in you know, 2005, and even now, it's still quite a lot of money. It made it very difficult. These services made it very, very difficult to opt out of, of these things. And so what happened was the inevitable um, crazy frog providers or similar services like that faced fines for, for these ripoff applications. And it happened. 40,000 pounds doesn't seem like a lot of money. And it happened right across Europe. And I, you know, anybody in the app space will understand that Europe probably represents about 40% of your revenues um, in the, you know, even in the, in the app store world. So you know, these things, when they happen, they tend to ripple in one European country and then ripple right across. And you know, these regulations didn't quite kill the industry. The smartphone did a good job um, of that as well. But it caused a major contraction in the mobile content industry around about 2005 and 2006. Why is this relevant? I think we're fast approaching the crazy frog moment of the smartphone generation. What's the crazy frog moment? Well, as I said, these were ringtone wallpaper subscription services using premium SMS billing. And regulations were introduced in most markets. They were introduced because the selling practices were unfair. The advertising was, uh, was misleading. And um, free wasn't actually free. And I think we've hit the tipping point in the kids' app business, because we know that free isn't free. Why have we hit that tipping point? 
Have a look at this. Mother's horror after her 10-year-old son racks up 600-pound bill in just three hours on a free iPhone game. This is typical European tabloid headlines. You see this all the time. Lee Walters paid 19 pounds ago for virtual diamonds and gold coins in heyday. His angry mother, Catherine, claims her old iPhone saved a password. We know that doesn't happen. We know Lee knew his mother's passwords. And Apple has agreed to refund the cash, but says users should be careful. That's just one example. That's actually pretty recent. I think this is, yeah, 17th of June. Here's another one. Dad has to sell his car and two motorcycles because child racks up $6,000 bill for in-application purchases. That's actually just from last week. And another. Apps that cost parents dearly. Children running up huge bills on supposedly free games on phones and tablets. These are very similar headlines to those headlines that appeared in 2005 when the regulators started to look into selling practices for premium content. And actually, we've started to see the fines. Uh, this is actually also last week. Apps firm fined 250,000 pounds for misleading subscription in children's apps. There was actually a fine issued by the UK regulator PhonePay Plus, who were also the enforcers in the original mobile content um, uh, days of those subscription services. And the app provider in this case is actually based in Australia. So, you know, as with COPPA, I, people are aware of the letters that were issued um, by the FTC around COPPA were issued globally, not just in the US. As with COPPA, regulatory enforcement is, is borderless. And now, so we've got PhonePay Plus and they're, they're now regulating um, apps. This one doesn't relate actually to IAPs. This is actually more like the older subscription services. Um, but it's an interesting example. And it's an interesting example because this is also a screenshot I pulled from a Europe, an app when I was back in Europe earlier in the week. Uh, this is a game, I, I, I won't name the publisher. We see the ad up the top here. This is clearly you know, not an appropriate ad for a kids app. Win 500 euro here. Click on it, you could win 500 euro in cash. Just simply answer the question below. Triangle has how many sides, one or three? And in between here it says, I think it says it costs 15 pounds to enter. Okay, and this 15 pounds will be billed in the same way that those old subscription services um, are billed. This is a serious issue. This is actually obviously in breach of <laughs> Apple's guidelines as well because there's a monetary transaction being, uh, being triggered from within the app. This is the sort of thing that will result in 250,000 pound fines. But what's even more interesting from an app perspective is the Office of Fair Trading uh, and their current investigation in the UK into smartphone games with costly in-app add-ons. The Office of Fair Trading in the UK regulates trade description. This is uh, from their site, consumer protection from unfair trading. You have, to quest you have to ask yourself, what is unfair trading? And what is unfair trading? It's quite a gray area, as we'll see in a moment. Um, but really, it's about when a consumer purchases a product or takes a product, does the product match the description? Is this, has it been sold right? Or if the, if the consumer knew everything about that product at the time of purchase, would they have made a different decision? That's fundamentally what unfair trading is about. And this is also from the Office of Fair Trading website. So it, it, it talks about general prohibition, misleading practices, actions, omissions, and aggressive selling practices. So it's quite literally a gray area, um, as you can see from their own, uh, from their own materials. Um, but it is, a, it is, given the consumer hype and the parental outrage at uh, high priced in application uh, purchases, you know, it's, a, it's an area that will be, I believe, regulated in Europe at some point within the next 12 to 18 months. And it will fundamentally change the app landscape. So I think the party is going to come to an end soon. I think what COPPA hasn't addressed, other jurisdictions will. I also think that the app stores are going to address it to head off this issue before it actually happens. And that's what I want to talk about now, which is what you can do and how you can be ready for when these changes happen. Um, I'm sure a lot of you probably watched the Worldwide Developer Conference, Apple's um, conference, and saw that Apple would be releasing with iOS 7 a new curated kids category on the App Store. So this is very interesting. It's something kids app developers have been asking for for a long time. Is there a place that parents can go just to download kids apps? Apple haven't issued rules um, on that yet, but I'm going to speculate on to how some of those rules might look in a few minutes. And based on conversations that I've had with um, various app stores, not just Apple, but with, with Google and, uh, and others. And similarly, Google are also addressing this 
This is one of our products. This is the, the launch of the, Nexus 7, or the new Nexus 7 last week. Um, uh, one of our products was demoed um, to demo a new feature in, um, in, in Android. And that's the restricted profile feature. And this is one of the ways that Google are looking at uh, addressing in-application purchases. Now, we were obviously very proud to work with uh, Google to demonstrate a new feature. But halfway through the process, it dawned on us that this feature could destroy our monetization. Because what it does, as you'll see here, is parents can now set up what they call restricted profiles for their children. And parents will be able to control what's seen in that, by the child, in the child account. So here we have the settings um, for our Beauty and the Beast application. And uh, we have everything on at the moment. So when the child plays the app, everything with a lock here, it's actually all one in-app application purchase. It's a 99 cent unlock for all of the puzzles. Um, but actually, if you click full restrictions or you know, in-application product displayed, when the child runs the app, they do not see. Not only are they not able to purchase the IAPs, they do not know the IAPs are even there. And that's quite an interesting, um, that's quite an interesting development. And obviously, we're very proud to work with them with uh, Google on that, but we're very concerned about how that will impact our monetization as well. So let's talk about, uh, about best practice. Um, and back to our monetization minefield. We, we really don't know. Uh, a minefield is something with potential risk, potential danger. We really don't know where, where we are going to end up with this. And unfortunately, if you think it's hard now to monetize kids' apps, it's going to become very, very hard in the future. I think in some ways, that good times um, are over. I think it will become very difficult to build high value, lifetime value models in the kids' app space. And I, I speculate that you know, for inclusion in the forthcoming kids' categories um, on the Apple App Store and other platforms, that um, we will see as a prerequisite, you will need to do things like cap your in application purchases introduce things like parent gates. So the parents, um, you know, uh, you have to get a just-in-time notification for, um, before, before you can actually download, or to give just-in-time notification before you actually uh, present an, uh, an IAP. Um, I think you'll probably see something around consumables versus discrete unlock features. Consumables are cited as, you know, as generally consumables when you see these sensationalist headlines and tabloids. It's that a child has downloaded coins or a child has downloaded gems. Consumables are consumable, they're gone. Versus unlockable features, which are there with you to stay, which is kind of a different, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a different thing. And I think that will be allowable. I mentioned just-in-time notifications. I think moderate cross-promotion will also be allowed, but cross-promotion will need to be parent-targeted. And um, that's really, really important for kids' app. If you're running any kind of a catalog, if you're a, if you're a kids' app publisher, um, that you moderate your cross-promotion, that maybe it's only aimed at parents. And that you give parents full information, not just in your privacy policy, but up front at the start of the app, you give parents full information about what is in this app. And unfortunately, that anything that you're doing in the cross-promotion space um, or in the, in the IAP space is off by default. And you know, all I can say to you is, if you have a relationship with your app store provider, start talking to them about this now. Um, we did, and um, I'm going to leave this presentation, close this presentation on, a, on an interesting note. Um, you know, we actually introduced some of these things um, in, our, in our apps recently, in one of our apps recently, and um, we made everything off by default. So we're very, we were very interested to see what would happen. And for my last slide, I'm going to show you the impact that it had on our, on our ability to cross-sell. Um, the red line is our cross-sell rate. Uh, which starts out at just under 30% and ends up at about 10%. The blue line is the number of updates that we had to the app. And you can see that as users updated the app, and you can just see that spike there, as users updated the app, that our cross-selling rate absolutely plummeted. So it's not a pretty picture. We're hanging in there on this. We're hoping that Apple's new kids category will at least help us with that the ability to sell our content better. We're hoping that some of the things that, that Google are doing at the moment, and also with the Google Play for Education Store, that we will have at least curated sections where our, we'll have better visibility of our content. But our ability to cross-sell our content has been extremely restricted um, by our decision to, to, to try out some of these things. So that's um, my, my slides to an end. I'm happy to take any questions on any of the three areas I covered, COPPA um, or Crazy Frog, if you want. 
um, our, um, you know, our best practice. Hi. Um, so this is relating to uh, copper regulations. Um, we have an app that um, we're trying to make appealing to like the 18 to 35 range, but the characters in that app could be considered like attractive to kids under 13 or familiar to them. Um, you know, we're sort of worried about the, you know, we aren't knowingly collecting any information from kids. And so does that in any way protect us? And also with the addition of sort of more mature content, um, does that in any way protect us if we are trying to actively make this a more mature app, mature app, or do we still need to abide by those regulations? Yeah, great, great question, and something I forgot to note. Um, you are not responsible for kids lying to you, okay? So if you age gate your app, I, you have a, uh, you know, a reasonable quality age gate in there, and you have a, and also a lockout period um, after that app is first launched, if somebody puts in an age underneath 13, um, then you should be okay. Um, so as long as you age gate it. Now people don't necessarily agree with age gating and certainly you know most eight year olds know how to bypass uh, an age gate but you cannot be held accountable if a child lies to you. Um. From last talk, um, the, the statistics was 90% of the kids' apps are, 90, uh, are, are free now, free to play now. Uh, given that there is the new development in, in the horizon, do you see um, pay, pay games having a resurface? Yeah, I actually do see uh, paid games making a resurgence, particularly in, um, in new uh, kids' categories that are, being, that are being introduced. And, you know, when we talked to our customers, we had a lot of backlash. We, our, co our content was all entirely paid, and then we started to introduce some IAP content. Parents said to us that they actually preferred our content when it was just fully paid and they knew exactly what they were buying. Not that we had consumables in there. We had discrete feature unlocks. But certainly, um, I think you will probably see... I don't think you'll see a major change in overall app store numbers in a tilt from, you know, from um, free to paid, but certainly in, in the kids section, you'll see a lot more paid content featuring. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. I found it very, very interesting, and I think that you really summarize things very succinctly. Thank you. The one thing that you just uh, kind of breezed over, which I just wanted to get more of your opinion on, is uh, this consent, this parental consent because it's a crazy thing, I mean, in the digital space to get parental consent. So if, for instance, you have an app that you know that kids under 13 are playing and you have an in-app purchase, for instance, let's say you unlock you know, the rest of the app for 99 cents, where does that parental consent come in? And practically speaking, how do you even achieve it? If you remember at the start of the presentation, COPPA does not regulate in-app purchases. COPPA just concerns the transmission, storage, the use of PII, personally identifiable information. So it doesn't affect you at all. The question is, and if you have a 99 cent unlock, I think anything that app stores might introduce at a later stage or that might be regulated across the European market is not going to cover you. If you have um, a model that you know, you're looking to achieve uh, an, an, an average revenue per paying user of you know, $99 per month or, you know, or, or whatever, then you might need to be a little bit worried in future. So the, 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 the parental consent really only covers the personally identifiable information and the use, and the use of that. It absolutely doesn't cover the, the IAPs. Um, and you know, you're right, there, it is a ridiculous situation, this idea of parental consent. There is an e a way to do it via email, but it's not just the, um, you know, you have to, I, I, mean, I, can, I can provide you with the website details for the full um, FTC guidelines on it, but instead of it uh, being a, look, you send an email, you need to be able, you, you really have to engage in, by response with that parent in that email, in that email discussion to actually confirm that, um, that the parent is who, who they're saying they are. The idea of using post or video conferencing, that is just ridiculous. But there are two separate issues, the, the, the online, the PII of an online services, versus the IAPs. I wouldn't be overly concerned if you're at that level. But there's two more, I think. Who has the mic? 
I think we one here on. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that question. Um, we've been doing a little bit of research around this as well. There are actually solutions out there that, that uh, give you verifiable parental con consent. Uh, if you look at companies like Veritad Technology, uh, they provide a transaction-based service, which I haven't worked out the cost for, but it looks probably prohibitive given how much money you make off uh, an individual user. But there are providers out there looking at these kinds of technologies right now. So. Yeah, I think there. That's, thank you for mentioning that. I think there are also there are safe harbor services which you can which you can use that will provide the same provide the same thing. It's probably the last question yeah. we have time for. Thanks. Um, what kind of time frame do you see this potentially rolling out with the app stores? With I mean, you've been interacting. Well, with Well, right? Apple Apple have said that they are introducing the kids category with iOS seven. So you're seeing that already. I mean, I think the Nexus, the second version of the Nexus 7 is on sale now. So the restricted profile is in there um, at the moment. How many people are, are using it beyond ourselves? Um, I'm not sure yet. I'm sure you'll see apps will be updated. But I think the question is, how long will it take before some of the issues that we're seeing in Europe, some of the kind of hysteria and hype um, becomes widely, um, widely regulated against? And I think probably that's the sort of a 12 to 18 month time frame. Um, I, I know that the, the Office of Fair Trading investigation is due to deliver, I think, preliminary results in, you know, in September and recommendations. It might look for, it might decide that what Apple are doing and what Google are doing might fix the issue. It might offer a code of conduct for app, app, app providers. But I definitely think we're going to see this come to a head over the next 12 to 18 months. Thanks. Get those IAPs and, in and, now. And, and covering a lot of that as well. So thanks so much. Okay, thank you.